Professor Amoso, what a great pleasure to be with you here at this symbolic site in the Freedom Park here in Pretoria. I'm really very, very glad to be here with you. And uh, uh, particularly glad for us to engage in a conversation, which will be a very informal conversation, about uh, mutual concerns. Uh, concerns that you have been exposing in your books, that I have been exposing in my books. Uh, I come from a different trajectory. I'm a philosopher, I'm a sociologist. I come from Europe, came from Africa. But in any case, we have been uh, developing ideas and concerns that uh, um, show that we are really converging into uh, some kinds of ideas uh, concerned as we are with emancipatory politics, with the liberation of people. Uh, and I think that our conversation uh, should focus a little bit uh, on this. I, I want to thank you for this occasion, for, for us to be here. And of course, I would start, we are going to be very informal as usual, uh, very formal conversation. But you have been uh, a, a very, and you are a very important philosopher uh, here in Southern Africa. And uh, you have been one of the uh, most distinguished philosophers emphasizing the idea that there is an African philosophy. That is to say, there is not philosophy in Africa, uh, but there is African philosophy. And as you know, this is a contentious concept. There are many colleagues uh, of yours that uh, dispute that. Uh, one of our colleagues that, in fact, with whom I had already a conversation, Professor Mudimbe, for instance, disputes that, uh, that idea. And I would like you to uh, start, just for a start, then we'll move on to all kinds of things. Why do you think uh, that there is an African philosophy when in one of your texts you say that Africa is usually no more than a footnote on an afterthought. Uh, so Africa has not been able uh, to speak for itself or for herself. Uh, I would like you to start the conversation precisely on this topic because I think it's crucial to your way of thinking. Thank you, Professor Boaventura. I also would like to thank you. Really thank you for inviting me to these uh, very important conversations. I uh, appreciate very much the initiative that you have taken so that we indeed become involved in conversations. Mm -hmm. Somehow it reminds me, of course, of Marcel Creole's conversations with Ogotomeli, mm -hmm. but maybe Maybe, but I like the term conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, I also like to thank you for making it possible for us to be here in a way that we can discuss in quite an informal way. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate this uh, informality around what we will be talking in, in our conversation. It is important for me, really, to, to start with a lot of disputable and disputed issues when uh, one wants to answer the question, is there an African philosophy? Well, one of the points I want to start with is that uh, evolutionary biology, archaeology, whatever you call it, suggests very strongly, mm -hmm. very strongly, that the human being as we know today mm -hmm. originates from this continent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I mentioned that these are still disputed, disputable issues, but you know, always there is a reason for dispute. Sometimes it may just be because of self-interest mm -hmm. to pursue a particular dispute. So I, I want to have this point noted that I do take seriously the point that in spite of the disputes, we can say, or I should like to, to align myself with the view that the human being as we know today 
originates from this continent. Mm -hmm. It is no surprise, therefore, that, for example, you will find a text under the title The African Exodus. You can see even the biblical significance of mm -hmm. that. But we're not talking the Bible except to mention mm -hmm. that this idea of exodus from mm -hmm. Africa mm -hmm. is quite serious. And the fact that this text is quite of recent origin does tell us something about the scientific advances mm -hmm. as far as this argument is concerned. So that is my first point about where exactly does the human being originate? Second, well, Africa is, as I argue in, in my writings, actually a baptismal name that has been given to the peoples of Africa. In fact, you write that you write Africa under protest. Precisely, <laughs> precisely under protest. Why is because, that? Because, you see, Professor, it is clear that if a parent gives a name to its child, the presumption is that the parent has got the power to do so. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the one who baptizes and gives the name mm -hmm. also has the power to do so. Mm -hmm. To imagine that in terms of disputed history anyway, because history for me is his story. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh -huh. it, mm -hmm. it, it, it is yet to become her story, mm -hmm. and finally it must become our, our story. story. Okay. So from that point of view, I, I want to say that precisely because the one who baptized the continent, Africa, baptized it by virtue of a certain power, by that, virtue of a certain That power. means that Africa had already a name before that. Which was that? In fact, this is the crucial point, because when you consider that the Romans and the Greeks just baptized the north of mm -hmm. the continent as Africa, the question remains how and why did this name spread to the rest That's of the continent? Absolutely. I'm still interested in an historian mm -hmm. who would actually give an explanation to this. Mm -hmm. But the point is that where there is power, especially violent, unjustified use of power, just as the Romans and the Greeks were mm -hmm. violent mm -hmm. in their conquest of these regions of Africa, those who subsequently conquered Africa were also invoking unjustified use Absolutely. of violence in order to establish themselves and their epistemological paradigms in this continent. Mm -hmm. So Africa is a baptismal name. Mm -hmm. you, see, you see, you are aware, of, I'm sure you are aware, Professor Ramos, that the indigenous people in Latin America and in the Americas yes. make that point as well. Exactly. But they have a name. Abi Ayala is yes. there, even today, in many of the meetings, the, the, the indigenous people yes. refuse to use America yes. or Latin America and use instead Abi Ayala, which was the name right. of the that area before the conquerors. True, and you see, because it has got so many regions and so many communities, what, what I'm suggesting is that the peoples of Africa do have the linguistic, cultural, and sociological resources mm -hmm. to come up with a democratically decided name for mm -hmm. the continent. The resources are there linguistically, uh, culturally they are there. Now, because of this conquest uh, and assimilation of false truths, mm -hmm. we still use the name, some of us under protest. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making is that Yes, like even even in, in New Zealand, they have their own name. That's right. For, you see, That's right. exactly. So the point I'm getting at is because of the size and the diversity in the continent, now that we are facing this as a problem, if we really want to take it seriously, 
surely we cannot doubt our linguistic and cultural resources for us to come up mm -hmm. with a name mm -hmm. that will be acceptable to all of us. And mm -hmm. that for me is not only a matter of democracy, it's also a question of justice. Mm -hmm. It will correct mm -hmm. the problem of justice that we still live under. The name Africa speaks to the point for me that the problem of justice that we have mm -hmm. still has to be resolved. And that's very interesting because in a sense uh, behind and underlying all your philosophy as I understand, and your text and so on, is the idea of historical injustice. That is to say, your, the first premise, we'll move on later on on this topic, but it looks like it is very important that uh, social injustice and all other injustices that exist in, in the world, for you, the historical one is absolutely a uh, matricial one is the basic underlying all the other injustices probably. It is very basic because it has also to do with the question of memory. memory. And memory also is related to the question of truth. Mm -hmm. For me, truth and justice are inseparable concepts. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. When you, you talk truth, you cannot talk it without at the same time talking justice. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't want to anticipate, but you and I are aware mm -hmm. that, in fact, when it comes to, to, to South Africa, for example, the TRC, mm -hmm. it is called the Truth mm -hmm. and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. The word justice is nowhere in the title. That's, so that's very interesting and not least problematic. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. any case, mm -hmm. uh, the point is that power has given us the name Africa and not ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we finally decide in the name of justice and de democracy on a name that is our own, mm -hmm. we will be recognizing ourselves as animals with reason. Mm -hmm. Not only animals with reason, but mm -hmm. animals which can use reason mm -hmm. in many ways focused also on the problem of justice. Mm -hmm. Now animals with reason are animals which are capable of wonder, of mm -hmm. surprises, of curiosity. And if wonder and curiosity belong to the element of what we call philosophy, generally speaking, mm -hmm. philosophia is love of wisdom. Of course. Surely, surely, Africa, given the antiquity of humanity here, mm -hmm. Africa then had and continues to have philosophy. Mm -hmm. It had. So we cannot say that the peoples of Africa have not the capacity to wonder at things. How do you see yourself in this? Uh, it's not a competition or a struggle, but it's really a movement to define the specific characteristics of African philosophy. Because if there is an African philosophy, then we have to distinguish it from European philosophy, from American philosophy, from Asian philosophy. Must be must have some specificity. And I'd like to know whether you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, I, I, I think we must be clear of, that's why I speak of philosophy in general as mm -hmm. love of wisdom. Mm -hmm. That one is really open to everyone who is human, wherever mm -hmm. they may be. Mm -hmm. But philosophy is a technical discipline, awesome. is a different issue. Mm -hmm. And that is generally where the, is the contestation is lodged. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that when one studies the contestations, one discovers that, no, you see, uh, at one stage, it is philosophia which is on the table. At another stage, it is philosophy, I like your word, discipline, mm -hmm. as a discipline. Now, philosophy as a discipline, we must remember, is a con construct. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a pure construct. Absolutely. And because it is a construct, we have to contest. I want to go back to your word again. You use the word universal mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. 
This you it's not my term, but the term is oui, Yes, I, I get it. But you see, this idea that philosophy is universal mm -hmm. is a subtle, almost inadvertent admission that those who have power have the power to create oneness out of pluriversality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that already is a point of contestation for of me. Course. By virtue of what power mm -hmm. do they uh, really can say philosophy is universal? Mm -hmm. Philosophy, given the fact that it arises from the living conditions of human experience, mm -hmm. that is where it arises from. It arises from the living conditions of human experience. Surely, when I live in Ghana, my experience is not absolutely the same mm -hmm. as the experience of someone living in Uganda or in South Africa. Mm -hmm. By virtue of this experiential diversity, different questions will arise and also different answers. Mm -hmm. And so, if we want to fit this into the concept of philosophy as a discipline, especially mm -hmm. as a discipline constructed unilaterally mm -hmm. in the name of mm -hmm. universality. And that, 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 why, that is yeah. really the critical okay. point. And that's, that's why you have to objectivize it, because the discipline is constrained, is, contra is constraining, and therefore, in order to keep that term, we have to objectivize African, European, Asian, Latin America, that's the only way to work within this idea, which I absolutely agree with you, that is the discipline in itself, by arrogating itself mm -hmm. uh, to be that particular kind of uh, way of knowledge being the philosophy and the discipline of philosophy. Because for me, in fact, philosophy or knowledge is, in general is a reflection on the ways in which we can experience the world as our own. Exactly. And very often, these philosophies, there were alien philosophies, so to say, mm -hmm. as disciplines, we are mean, talking about disciplines, that were transposed through colonialism yeah. to the rest of the world. They don't allow the people to experience their own world as their own. That's it. And therefore, if, if the, the world is not experienced as their own, uh, of course, they cannot transform it that in their own terms, in yes. their own name. So I, I agree with you, and that's where there is a a convergence uh, uh, between uh, us in here mm -hmm. that in fact this claim for knowledge, claim for philosophizing as, as a, and the need to make the, the world our own is absolutely crucial. But then the question comes and that's, uh, that is very interesting in your work that on one side you look at this Africa, let's take the Africa, the name is there, mm -hmm. we already uh, uh, have uh, said and mentioned this is a baptismal uh, type of name. The name is there, we have not invented one yet, another one. But in any case, there is this quest mm -hmm. for authenticity. Mm -hmm. But on one side, you are very keen in your texts to underline the diversity of African experiences. Uh, you just mentioned that, you mm -hmm. know, different countries, different um, uh, ethnic groups, different regions, they have different experiences of the world and therefore, nevertheless, there is something, a thin line that unites them mm -hmm. and that allow us to speak of African mm -hmm. philosophy. So that's precisely that line that unites all this diversity mm -hmm. that I'd like you to elaborate a little bit Yes, um, the first line, you know, history, as I said, is problematical. For example, you have a very strange concept called prehistory. Of right. course, that is a nice way of saying the period about which we know nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, <laughs> you, you, you can call it, in other words, now after history becomes a discipline, right. we can talk sense, as <laughs> if there was no sense before. Okay, now, um, having said that, I want to say that a, one of the lines that we must recognize is that, for example, the Sahara Desert mm -hmm. is surely not the birthmark of Africa, like the navel of a baby. Mm -hmm. The Sahara Desert 
grew in time. Before it expanded, mm -hmm. we must recognize that the peoples of Africa were interacting as one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is quite mm -hmm. Serious. Mm -hmm. The the Namib, these deserts are geographical divides that come later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they by coming into being, they do not obliterate the cultural contacts that have been there before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now one line that emerges out of these cultural lines mm -hmm. is the line which I like to call Humanness. Humanness, yes. Over here. As opposed we, to humanism. Exactly. Humanness is not the same thing as humanism. Mm -hmm. I must admit that in reading some of the philosophical texts by our African sisters and brothers, one notices that a distinction is not always made between speaking English and writing philosophy. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is why sometimes you find that this humanness mm -hmm. is simply conveyed as humanism. Okay, Professor Ramos, as I was saying, we are uh, entering a topic, the topic of Ubuntu, which is one of the words or concepts most talked about, probably misunderstood, probably abused. And um, it is not a unique phenomenon in Africa. Because uh, some of my work in Latin America, I work a lot with indigenous peoples movement. And the indigenous peoples have, um, in, the, in the process of their struggles, they have managed to bring to the political agenda catch-all words. That is to say, non-colonial concepts uh, or concepts that are not expressed in colonial uh, languages. Mm -hmm. And they say and they claim that translation Absolute translations is impossible. We can approximately see what does it mean or not. One of the most uh, um, famous concepts is the concept of summa causa, which in Quechua means good living. Not living better, good living, uh, buen vivir in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about that. Many people have been writing about that. The indigenous peoples write about that. But I, I think that. Uh, we are coming to an age in which these concepts, which is part of the struggles, I would say, I would think even of a, a new wave of decolonial thinking, the, the process that we are in a sense decolonizing the social sciences, decolonizing philosophy. These concepts that in the past were just um, exoticisms, now they become part of the struggle. They become serious concepts in philosophy or social sciences, and they become part of the struggle. For instance, summa causa now is in the uh, Equatorian constitution as a concept, a, a catch-all concept. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we have Ubuntu. So I'm not claiming that I'll be understanding everything very deeply, what you are going to say, but what I promise is that I will be listening deeply as you say in one of your texts. So I'll be listening deeply. Let's sit down and um, yes. have an, our conversation on Ubuntu, and then I'll ask some issues, as I feel yes. fit. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Um, well, uh, that was, of course, the, the, the first line. Uh, I will mention in parentheses the second line, and then I come back to Ubuntu. The, 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 the second line is the line of the commonly shared experience of colonization. Now, I say commonly shared uh, with qualification because some of Africa was colonized uh, 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 by the French, another part by the Portuguese, another by the English, let, let us not forget that even Islam has a role. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, uh, what I'm, I, I want to say is that even if I say commonly, mm -hmm. I recognize that the experience that Francophone Africa can have of colonization will be different from the experience that those of us who were colonized by the English have will be different from. But what is a common thread mm -hmm. is that 
we were colonized. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can talk about that later, but it is an mm -hmm. important experience. Now getting to Ubuntu, I see that you, you also make an important reference to the point that, you know, these indigenous concepts have for a long time been suppressed, silenced, and excluded. Mm -hmm. Again, that is the reason of power. That is the so-called right of conquest, which made that possible. I should like to, to make preliminary remarks uh, which pertain to your input on this point. One of the remarks is that you mentioned that one of the indigenous concepts is already part of the constitution mm -hmm. in one of the Latin American countries. Well, let us consider this. By, by some accident, I followed some legal studies in, in South Africa, although I didn't complete that, but I did that in the University of South Africa. Mm -hmm. One of our textbooks written by eminent jurists, uh, uh, namely Professors Hallow and Kahn, um, is called the South African Legal System and its Background. I think I want to repeat the title, the South African Legal System and its Background. Well, this is a text of more than 600 pages. Mm -hmm. I found it very interesting that even, even a study of all the footnote references in the text, not once will you find the word Bantu, let alone Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So it struck me, I began to ask, what is the, what is the South African legal system and its background? The people in South Africa, the Bantu-speaking peoples, the, the, the Sun and the Kwe peoples, hardly form a footnote, let alone part of the main text, just a footnote. So, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a text of 600 pages plus, to forget that, raises more questions than it answers, of course. I thought that, oh, maybe that was accidental. So I studied other texts, mm -hmm. also around 600 pages plus on, on South African legal philosophy. Again, no Bantu, no Ubuntu. Wow. And finally, I got a textbook prescribed at the University of Pretoria in one of their departments in law. Mm -hmm. I looked, searching for footnotes, very specifically searching for Bantu or Ubuntu. This is very recent. Mm -hmm. No Ubuntu, no Bantu. Mm -hmm. Now we come to your point about the Constitution. So informal, informal studies. Mm -hmm. The Bantus are not there, even if they are in this country. Mm -hmm. So we are here, but we are not technically present. Mm -hmm. Well, come the Constitution with all the euphoria around it. You find two parts of the Constitution. The 1993 one, which is the British Constitution, and of course the 1996 one, mm -hmm. Act 108 of 1996. Well, in the one of 1993, you do indeed find the term Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. But since we are talking disciplines, like we were talking the discipline of philosophy, I think we also have to talk the discipline of law here. Mm -hmm. 
according to standard teaching we had at the time in terms of interpretation of statutes, we were taught that what appears in the preamble or the postamble is certainly not part of the law. It is only a kind of ornament. You put salt into what you have, but you may not take it seriously mm -hmm. as far as the law is concerned. And exactly that is where you find Ubuntu mm -hmm. in the post umble. It's just nice footnote, not having any serious technical significance. Mm -hmm. Now, this is at the time if I may borrow the terminology from, from uh, history of, of Western evolution of ideas, this is now the time of enlightenment in South Africa. Of course, it's, just, it's not just an accidental borrowing because mm -hmm. even at the time, there were arguments, of, especially in the um, Africana community. So they described the other one group as verkramt and the mm -hmm. other one as verlicht. Mm -hmm. So they were enlightened. Mm -hmm. So even by the time of enlightenment, the Bantu or Ubuntu became just a footnote. Mm -hmm. We do not exist. Mm -hmm. Well, that was in the 1993 constitution. Come the 1996 constitution, which is supposed to be final, Ubuntu is nowhere to be found. Nowhere. So you have to ask yourself the question, is it really collective amnesia that all who were involved in so-called negotiations just simply forgot that at least Ubuntu appeared just as an ornament? Now this final constitution doesn't need ornaments anymore. Mm -hmm. We just will go straight to the heart of the matter. So you see, Professor, Ubuntu by itself has got a problem. And how does the judiciary solve this problem of deliberate exclusion of Ubuntu? I cannot, I, cannot, I cannot talk the language of, oh, you know, this was collective accidental amnesia. I doubt it very much. That is why I prefer to describe it as deliberate exclusion. But, but do you have, a, you have an argument that goes even further than that. One is to say that this a deliberate exclusion. The other is to say that if the name were there and would mean something, the Constitution wouldn't be like the one that we have now. Slowly we're getting there. <laughs> but, but before getting there, that's what I think that I want you to uh, explain a bit more. In order to get to that eventual conclusion, what is in fact Ubuntu? When the Ubuntu was in play, what is prior to the Constitution, prior to many of all these discussions, prior to all these books on, on jurisprudence, there is, in your view, Ubuntu exactly. as a living, philosophical concept of the Bantum people in the region of the world. Explain to me yeah. what is the, is, what is it? Some yes. people say, well, Ubuntu is, I am because you are. Look at this. Uh, or others go to Kvasi Biredu, life is mutual aid, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, that would be also similar to Ubuntu. I don't think that satisfies no. you. No, it, it doesn't satisfy. For sure. Tell me then. You see, uh, this is what I meant by talking English and talking <laughs> philosophy. Okay. Uh, also, there is the tendency, and I'm glad you mentioned that already, for example, to say Ubuntu is I am because we are. You give a definition, yeah. Which, of course, even Martin Buber can, can be said to have had. Absolutely. He so, he so, can do. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, so, w what is it? What I, uh, uh, some people say Ubuntu is respect for other people. Well, uh, even if you're not an Ubuntu adherent, 
and you live in Brazil or in New Zealand, you would still have the idea that respect for other people is good. Mm -hmm. Ubuntu is you may not kill others. That is uh, uh, cataloging. It is not philosophizing. Mm -hmm. It is just grabbing catalogs. Catalog. Mm -hmm. you, you give a catalog, but the problem is that when you present this catalog, you present it in definitional terms because you say Ubuntu is. Mm -hmm. So you're claiming that you're defining. Mm -hmm. And yet, what you're doing is just to draw from general experience and then you attach mm -hmm. to Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. Let us look at it from a different angle, the angle of non-catalog, mm -hmm. the angle of philosophical discourse. When we look at it from that point of view, noting indeed your uh, great submission that anyway you don't command the language, we accept that. We, we very much appreciate the fact that as a scientist, whether a sociologist or a philosopher, you are prepared to listen. Mm -hmm. Now, this Ubuntu, of course, belongs in, in the category of Bantu languages to the Nguni speaking group. Mm -hmm. The same type of word we use in the Sotho speaking group, we, we say Bhutu. You see, when you cross the boundaries to go to Zimbabwe, same concept, but it will be called Hunu because they speak Shona. Mm -hmm. And so you can expand even into Kiswahili. So what is interesting about this is that from a philosophical point of view, you have a compound word. Mm -hmm. You have Ubu on one side and Ntu on the other side. If you break down this word, even in Sotho languages, bo and to. Mm -hmm. So you see, it is not only the point of linguistic exercise that is at issue here. It is also the question of philosophical conceptual analysis. Okay. And so you find that when you look at this ubu or who in Shona, when you look just at this Ubu, there is nothing sure at all. Ubu is the highest level of generality in ontological terms, mm -hmm. in ontological terms, in the terms of being. Mm -hmm. Because you can say Ubu, mm -hmm. and instead of conjoining it with ntu, the same ubu, you can conjoin it with something like shungu. It can become ubu shungu, pain. Mm -hmm. You see, you can uh, conjoin it with so many others. What remains, that is why I call it the highest level of generality in ontological terms, mm -hmm. because this ubu stands free ontologically mm -hmm. to be coupled with so much. Mm -hmm. That is one aspect about it. The second aspect is this one, and this is philosophically crucial. It is the point that precisely because it is ubu, it is hanging, it is in motion. Mm -hmm. It is in permanent suspense of being. In other words, the philosophical point of departure for Ubuntu will be motion mm -hmm. and not rest. Mm -hmm. Of course, a Western-trained philosopher will say, wow, Heraclitus already declared that, Pantare, everything is in motion. Well, 
we don't talk copyright of reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if Heraclitus thought about it, oh, God. it doesn't follow that no, but no other human being has even thought about it before Heraclitus. If we take seriously into account my initial mm -hmm. point as we were walking, mm -hmm. that if the human being as we know actually originated from here, then Heraclitus is uh -huh. a, li a lad of yesterday. <laughs> and so we cannot immediately jump and say, but Heraclitus said, mm -hmm. we rather can acknowledge a coincidence of philosophical insights. If not even its source. Precisely, <laughs> if not even its source. So, therefore, we don't have only in ontological terms, we don't have only the highest level of generality. We have also the principle, the recognition that when you look at Ubu, you recognize that being is being. That's why in my writings, I write being with yeah, hyphen, hyphen. Mm -hmm. It is not accident. It is not because I speak English. <laughs> it is because I speak philosophy that I write it as an hyphenated word. Mm -hmm. And I compare it with being, mm -hmm. which I also write as a normal English. But if one has followed the reasoning, mm -hmm. one can see why this one is being and the other one is being. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, because of the multiple possibilities of coupling Ubu mm -hmm. with any, when you couple it with Ntu, you couple it with something that is normative in the sense that it has also an ontological reference point. Mm -hmm. and how do you arrive at an ontological reference point? Now, ubu is like many other words in our languages. It is like umu. One can say, for example, umu, and uwat, umlungu, mm -hmm. meaning a white person, mm -hmm. right? But umu can also be coupled with ndu. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm going. When you couple it with ntu, it becomes umuntu, mm -hmm. an ontologically, empirically recognizable being which we call a human being. Mm -hmm. Now, this human being shares something in common with the ntu of Ubuntu, because mm -hmm. we have the same suffix, mm -hmm. right? right? So having the same suffix means there is somehow insight identity there. And this one goes to the direction of Ubuntu must have, in the ethical sense. And therefore, I will prefer even the word Ubuntu ought to have Ubuntu, mm -hmm. you see, in, in the, that's why I call it normative. Ubuntu is normative because its point of reference is Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. And Ubuntu has got the obligation um. to become ethical. Mm -hmm. Any Ubuntu who is not ethical is said to be some, a thing. We don't mean literally you are a thing. We see that you are a human being. But we will even use terms like kisi uh, silosi. When you say, it denies that. You say hasimu to silosi. It means you are not a human being. You are really this thing. Mm -hmm. Now, to be a human being is to be a moon too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is when you can come with what precisely does it mean mm -hmm. to be ethical from the perspective of Ubuntu? Mm -hmm. It is exactly when you have established this foundation that you can come to begin to reason the ethical question, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. Now, this Ubuntu 
and umundu, being subject to the principle of motion, mm -hmm. will have to evolve an ethics that speaks to attunement to being in motion. Mm -hmm. But your formulation, in English at least, mm -hmm. uh, sounds very much like an individualistic metaphysics because you are talking about oneself, one. Who is this one? That is to say, Ubuntu appeals to an ontology, an ontology that you, in one of your texts you say is an ontology of visible and invisible beings, the living, the living dead, and not yet born. When you say that he or she is being truthful, he or she is what? Uh, I think that Ubuntu has a connection here with the, the, the priority of the community uh, through which uh, this uh, Ubu, this very enfolded generality, becomes constructed in uh, real life and in concrete action, which is the suffix, is the one that has to be constructed in a kind of a community type of life, which originally, at least in many continents, this uh, ontological community is very proper of the rural areas, which some, some people may question that uh, when people are moving to the urban areas, do they take Ubuntu with them? Do, do they do uh, keep this truthfulness in the same ways and with same ethical references? I don't know if uh, I, I think myself yes. understood, but I'd like you to address yes. community individual, not mm -hmm. as a polarization, would be another Western uh, dichotomy, mm -hmm. but how are they embedded in your yes. thinking? Yes. You see, um, community is slightly a big jump mm -hmm. because this being and being mm -hmm. uh, means fundamentally, relationality. Mm -hmm. So, even for example, uh, uh, Bujo is shifting from that. He actually uh, uh, writes, uh, well, he uses the Latin expression, cognatus mm -hmm. ergo sum. Exactly. I am related, therefore we are. Mm -hmm. So, you see, being, is already in ontological terms. Mm -hmm. In ontological terms, being is already the ontological context of relationality. It's a co-being. Exactly, yeah. co-being. Not only with human beings only, but even if I may use the expression with nature in general. I say, if I may use, because the human being is still part of nature, of nature anyway. Of exactly. Mm -hmm. So, if we look at it that way, that this is being is co-being. Mm -hmm. It is relationality. Now, out of this relationality, in action with and through others, a community is born. That's why I would say a community is slightly of a big jump if we don't stress the relationality at the ontological level. The community is the process of the construction of this relationality. Re exactly. It's not a given. It's not a given. Yeah. A community is not a given. Mm -hmm. It is a construction of mm -hmm. uh, arising out of this relationality. Mm -hmm. And therefore, because it is a construction, it demands ethical principles. It Absolutely. demands Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So. When we look at it that way, one sees that, ah, the, here we now have a situation in which we cannot speak, and I'm glad you, you, you already noted that, we cannot speak of the dominance of the community mm -hmm. over the individual, Perfect. or we cannot even describe mm -hmm. the, the, the Ubuntu perspective as individualistic. We cannot, simply because being brings about beings, mm -hmm. and beings must look at one another. Mm -hmm. Beings must interact with mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. and 
in that interaction, something is born, which is a community with an ethics that is constructed from time to time, recognizing that it will change mm -hmm. because conditions do not remain the same. Mm -hmm. What will not change is the demand for truth and the demand for justice mm -hmm. in the construction of this. Mm -hmm. So, if I leave my tribal, rural community and I go to what is called an urban area, mm -hmm. whatever else happens there, mm -hmm. I am still going to be sensitive to the demands of truth and the demands of justice. Mm -hmm. To be in an urban environment does not by itself exempt anybody. Even the people who were born in urban areas, they have no ontological or existential exemption to actually not be bothered by justice mm -hmm. and truth. Mm -hmm. I referred already to the exclusions of Ubuntu. And um, I did mention, uh, like you rightly point out in some of my writings, that no, you know, this is not just the exclusion of the world. It is also the exclusion of a people and their philosophy. Now, the dominant philosophy in this country, for example, and which is also operational in terms of economic globalization. The dominant philosophy is exactly what I just mentioned. Thou shalt kill, but in a civilized way. Mm -hmm. This is what we have. So if you were to include Ubuntu in the constitution, with its philosophical temperament and normal, normative demands, you would not have this as a basic point of departure. Mm -hmm. You would not have thou shalt kill, mm -hmm. never. First of all, you will not have that because it is just not the ethical norm from mm -hmm. which we begin. So you would not have that. Mm -hmm. So because you would not have that, you would be confronting another epistemological paradigm. And this confrontation would have to be resolved. Are we taking Ubuntu in order to promote, respect, and protect human life? Or are we taking uh, liberalism with its liberal capitalism with its consequence and first principle being thou shalt kill under, assumedly, I don't say the situations are it's Civil really that, civilized, yeah. no. Uh, but you know, I use civilized in, in yeah. inverted <laughs> commas. Uh, uh, you know, the, for me, this, this way is really, we have provided with a jungle, mm -hmm. but under the guise of civilization, mm -hmm. where killing is permitted mm -hmm. indiscriminately. And this you would not have had mm -hmm. under Ubuntu, one. Second thing that you would not have had under Ubuntu, taking its point of departure as motion as the principle of being, mm -hmm. is that you would not have a constitution posited as the supreme law of the country like mm -hmm. we have here or in other countries, when it, it, the Constitution as a supreme law is quite problematical because it has what in, 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 in the legal discipline, uh, you know, sometimes you have the essential features doctrine. You, you, if, if, if you don't have this, then you don't have it at all. You must have the... Philosophy knows mm. how to critique essentialism. Mm -hmm. I will not go to that yet, except to make the point that when the Constitution stands as virtually, and I say virtually absolute and immutable, it runs directly contrary 
to the principle that everything is in motion. Why is it that the Constitution itself should not be in motion? You get my point. I it, don't. Th this, this fixation is an ism. That is why we see in English constitutionalism and not but, constitutionalness. But, 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 but there is a constitution because there is a state, because uh, this uh, priority this Grundgesetz of the, the Grundnorm of the, 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 the Constitution is, uh, is uh, as a primacy because there is a state which has the monopoly of the violence according to the Weberian conception. So in the end, for you, the state is, is inimical of Ubuntu. Ubuntu doesn't go together with the modern state uh. because the state is fixity. The state is rigidity, is yeah. institutions, departments, laws, uh, uh, functionaries, staff, and so on. So it's about fixity. Well, well, I An Ubuntu state I, is a contradiction in adjecto. It sounds like a big jump, let me put it that way. Okay. Uh, when we take the constitutional history of this country, mm -hmm. for example, uh, you find that before 1993, the constitutional principle that ruled mm -hmm. was the principle of parliamentary supremacy. Mm -hmm. So parliament was supreme. And that makes a lot of sense to me. It is still supreme in the UK and it is still democratic. They simply, lately after big debates on do we need a Bill of Rights, finally the UK has yeah. got enacted a Bill of Rights, which does not in any way in the UK, for example, it does not in any way eradicate and exclude the principle of parliamentary supremacy. But so what, one, what, what one difference has, does it make a written or an unwritten the, constitution? The British is unwritten. I know. Exactly. What and is the this difference? one, yes, I think the difference is more... Because the written case. one is also... Uh, you know, able to be interpreted, and the Constitutional Court in, in South Af Africa has interpreted the Constitution sometimes yeah. in contradictory ways. I mean, there's also motion there. Uh, 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 yes and no. Uh, you see, uh, the British is unwritten, and yet it is interpretable by the courts. Mm -hmm. So I think the question of written, written is a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. What I'm getting at is a matter of principle and, and justice is the following. Mm -hmm. That for more than 300 years, parliamentary supremacy was the constitutional principle that ruled South Africa. You see? So the question is not, do you need or don't you need a constitution? It says, what constitutional principle do you put in place? Parliamentary supremacy would be in tune with Ubuntu thinking to some extent because it is almost amenable to flexibility. It is always amenable to interrogation in a way that is different from this one that is fixed as a god. But this, Professor Ramos, takes us to a very controversial proposal that the, the apartheid regime was closer to Ubuntu than the post-apartheid. I, I, I don't think that uh, we must uh, forget uh, this one. We mustn't forget that everything was not apartheid because apartheid in South Africa was really born in 1948. But the problem that we are talking about predates 1948. Okay. So from the point of view of history, the, even apartheid can just be put in brackets. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was the worst and whatever, but you know, it was the continuation of the same thing by other yes. means. So, so I, I, I don't think a, 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 the principle I'm speaking of, really has to do with, therefore, apartheid was bad. One cannot infer that. Mm -hmm. When I'm looking just at the principle, what I want to say is 
this, that this principle of parliamentary supremacy, mm -hmm. uh, at least on the face of it, preserves the idea that the people are the sovereign. Mm -hmm. The people are the sovereign. It preserves that. And therefore, because the people are the sovereign, they will be able to declare and make the law through their representatives in parliament. Okay, one. Mm -hmm. This one transfers sovereignty from the people to the constitution. There is a different, mm -hmm. it's a shift of paradigm. Mm -hmm. It's Got a complete you. paradigm change. I agree. Exactly, you. and this is what I'm questioning mm -hmm. uh, at two levels. At the political level, I want to ask, why is it that parliamentary supremacy was correct most of the time, even under the 1983 constitution in this country, parliamentary supremacy was correct? I'm mentioning specifically the 1983 constitution because some of the thinkers and make uh, advisors on that constitution actually call it a racial federation. In other words, what the, the, we, the in South African terminology is called white, Indian, and colored. Mm -hmm. They were together in the 1983 constitution. It was a racial federation because they did not have territorial claims, that was the implication. Mm -hmm. The Indian does not have a territorial claim to South Africa, so we cannot put him in an Indian stamp. Mm -hmm. The colored doesn't have a territorial claim, so we can't put them in a colored stamp. Mm -hmm. Okay, whites own everything, they will divide it by the mercy of God to everybody else. And that's why they divided it and they sent it, they gave it to the so-called Bantu, the Bantu stands. Mm -hmm. I must mention with emphasis that I surely do not subscribe to the term colored. Mm -hmm. It is a political device to confuse issues. I can come to that later. Okay. But I really don't like the term colored. It is unjustified. Okay, now, the point I'm moving at is politically, when they, they now decide, ha, huh, we want the Bantus to become part and parcel of this whole process of new constitution making. Ha, huh, when the Bantus come, we must do something now. We must abandon this principle that the people are sovereign and now persuade them to accept the principle that the Constitution is supreme. Mm -hmm. That is why it becomes also a God who is absolute, who can tell you before time what is good for you. If you are not sure of what is good for you, please come to me. I am the court. I will tell you what is good for you. Forever okay. like that, that cannot be consistent with mm -hmm. me. It cannot. Truth, truth is ever negotiable, ever changing. Mm -hmm. It is ever, and because it is linked inseparably to justice, a constitution that is designed to preempt the, the, the demands of justice in <laughs> advance can never surely be consistent Absolutely. with I... Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. It can never be. First, in its character as an ism. Second, in its ethical dimension as a pretext mm -hmm. that it has all truth about what is just. Mm -hmm. This is problematic. But, but, you but, but, but so your, your argument is even stronger, is, is, the, the, is the argument that in fact this constitution, and you mentioned that in one of your texts, in fact transmuted unjust privileges into rights. Precisely. And uh, this is the, the core of the matter, there is the core of the violation of Ubuntu philosophy. In your exactly, exactly. This is exactly this transmutation which is now taking refuge in a constitution that may not be questioned. 
But now you, you see. <laughs> so now the question is precisely there that you see philosophically uh, and ethically, it is unsustainable. The exclusion of Ubuntu by those who thought about this exclusion, probably, and this is giving them perhaps more credit than they deserve, but probably it was because they recognized exactly that if we allow Ubuntu to speak in the new constitutional dispensation, in, in other words, to really speak its authenticity and to really speak its mind, mm -hmm. then even this transmutation will no longer be there. The transmutation of injustice, privileges, are now transmuted into rights. And therefore, you are invited into human rights discourse. This invitation is false. That's why I'm saying uh, Ubuntu is concerned about truth. So the fallacy of this invitation is one thing that is recognized. The injustice that goes together with mm -hmm. this invitation invites instead a challenge to this principle of constitutional supremacy because mm -hmm. it is purely a matter of strategy and tactics. Yeah, but, if but, it were not a matter of strategy and tactics, uh -huh. if this is the so-called best constitution in the world, why is it that the UK can still respect human rights and still have the principle of parliamentary supremacy? Let's, so, let, let's go further because this is this fascinating. Of course, you are very much aware that your position is a very minority position. Exactly, in this I'm very much aware. I'm <laughs> because very, very people very... think that this is a constitution and so on. And that is very progressive in in way or, or the other. But, but let's do this. If there is a profound incompatibility between Ubuntu and this constitution, as you claim, then how can we understand that so many well-known lawyers, well-known philosophers, justices of the Constitutional Court, have been writing sentences, decisions in the name of Ubuntu, and Ubuntu is spoken here and there, and spoken also about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, because it's about harmony, it's about the restoration of equilibrium, and so on. So it looks like there are two Ubuntus, one deep, very deep, which is the one you are talking about, in the superficial construction of Ubuntu that is going around and being subjected to many different uses convenient to the structures of power in this, uh, uh, in this context of South mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. And this, in fact, um, leads me to think that uh, uh, you say something that but which I think, I, I, when I compare with the, the Andean, and the indigenous peoples in Latin America is, it sounds, it's very truth, very truthful and very true, is the idea that time never destroys truth. So in the state of, uh, of, uh, of prescriptions, as we say, state of, state of limitations, can never uh, 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 apply. I think that you, from there, you develop the argument that in fact, this constitution is still based on an unjust colonial conquest. And therefore, as long as the land is not restored and restituted to the legitimate owners of this land, this constitution is a product of conquest and not an undoing of the conquest. Is, it, is this a fair reading of your... I believe you read me fairly, uh, Professor. I, 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 I will, I'm grateful for that reading. I just want to clarify and emphasize mm -hmm. a, a, a few points. You, you started off by suggesting, uh, by way of question, how come that so many um, educated people, lawyers and what, have accepted the, 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 this is really a constitution we were waiting for. It is really one of the best. I think that when we look at uh, education in 
colonial and post-colonial Africa. We should not underestimate uh, the fact that the so-called right of conquest mm -hmm. was coupled with what I would like to call epistemicide. Yeah. The epistemicide. The term I use a lot as well. Exactly. As is your... Exactly. This <laughs> epistemological uh, 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 killing of mm -hmm. other ways of mm -hmm. knowing and doing was not totally successful. Of course. Not. But what it had done was to ensure, as people like Ali Mazrui would put mm -hmm. it, that Western centers of knowledge, even universities and colleges at the time, were simply transmission belts. That is the expression mm -hmm. that Mazrui is. Transmission belts of an epistemological paradigm totally foreign mm -hmm. to Africa. Mm -hmm. This was imbibed, this was assimilated to the point that it looked so normal that by the time you say you have a better constitution, you are in the same dialogical plane, mm -hmm. dialogical plane, epistemologically speaking. Mm -hmm. So you speak the same language. It is only if you apply a critique like a, 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 a Ngugi Wationgo and other mm -hmm. African literary writers will argue. If you begin to apply a critique aimed at decolonizing the, the mind, mind. Of course. aimed at decolonizing the mind, then you will want to pause and say, why is it that this constitution is what it is? Mm -hmm. It takes into account only one part of the history mm -hmm. of this country, and it makes sure it is going to underline the privileges of that segment, transmute them into rights, and it is all done. Mm -hmm. And since you are speaking the same epistemological language, it becomes easy if you have not really applied your mind to it. Mm -hmm. And education is still new. In colonial Africa, very few people were educated. Mm -hmm. In decolonized Africa, still very few people are educated. Perhaps think, for mm -hmm. the better, because mm -hmm. what <laughs> does it help to continue assimilating uncritically, as uh, Bondi will say. You know, yeah. Bondi, I like very much his article, Can There Be a Latin American mm -hmm. Philosophy? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. argues very, very clearly yeah. with uh, this uncritical assimilation mm -hmm. of concepts mm -hmm. is quite a problem. I don't think South Africa and many other African countries have been exempt from mm -hmm. this uncritical assimilation. And therefore, it doesn't surprise me when you say, I am in the minority. I recognize that. Mm -hmm. I recognize that. But being in the minority shows that at least there is reason to continue struggling mm -hmm. because justice and truth still have to be seen to be Mm -hmm. Alive and living but, reality. But, but, but it's, 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 uh, I think to pursue this line, it's, it's very important that uh, uh, we should now see what are the continuities between apartheid and post apartheid. Mm -hmm. I'd like to discuss further that with you. Mm -hmm. But it is very important in this respect to distinguish between what you call the democratization paradigm mm -hmm. and the decolonization paradigm. Exactly. The two paradigms were present in the negotiations, and in fact, it is the democratization paradigm that is going to prevail. And therefore, the Constitution is the product of the democratization paradigm, not of the decolonization. Exactly. Which implies, of course, that colonization goes on under different names, under different strategies. But in any case, are there discontinuities or 
that may be uh, used for struggle. That is to say, does the Bantum people, as you would say, have no more arguments to struggle, or on the contrary, or on the contrary, they have less uh, arguments because, in a sense, they may be uh, victims of the illusion that the democratization, in fact, uh, solved also the problem of decolonization, and one is taken, the part is taken for the for the totality. Uh -huh. is, uh -huh. is it possible? Yes. To think that, or I, I, I think I like even the point you made earlier, whether or not uh, by uh, advancing the argument I am advancing, am I not saying, well, the state is incompatible with Ubuntu? Yeah. Well, let us leave the 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 many arguments around the concept of state aside. Mm -hmm. Whatever the state is, two points I think must be acknowledged. One is that the state cannot and has never come before human beings. Mm -hmm. Human beings, as Rerum Novarum would put it, mm -hmm. always are anterior they come before the state. So, because they come before the state, when they create one, they have just one, many intentions, but one that underlies it all mm -hmm. is that within the state, their rights will be respected, recognized, and promoted. And Rerum Novarum goes further to argue that if the state were seen to be seen not to be doing this, then there is no reason to have one. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I follow that reasoning too, and I'm saying since we have it as a fact, mm -hmm. the state, it is still necessary to test it against this yardstick. Does it really recognize, respect, and promote the rights of the people. Now, at the time when I wrote the, the article uh, you refer to, indeed, democratization and decolonization were the major paradigms. But we must remember that at the very same time, democracy was already steadily being overcome by incipient democracy. Mm -hmm. So, now, we can no longer speak, even when we have a so-called democracy in 1994. Mm -hmm. We must remember that we are talking about something that has long been overtaken. Now, to show that this has long been overtaken, that's why earlier on I referred to so-called negotiations. Mm -hmm. There is a serious issue here, Professor. You know, already around 1994, Alistair Sparks published a book called Tomorrow is Another Country. Uh, before him, of course, Pilger wrote a book called Freedom Next Time. Yeah. And later on, closer to our time, uh, Professor Sam Peter Blanche wrote uh, uh, another book, smallish, serious book called Lost in Transformation. And then his colleague, Professor Esther Eze, wrote another one called Endgame. A careful study of these texts shows very clearly that even before public negotiations, there were very serious and conclusive, decisive negotiations. These books show very mm -hmm. clearly. 
that this was the case. Mm -hmm. I am really surprised that those mentioned by name in those texts, mm -hmm. I have not yet heard them object to the contents of the books. So for politicians, things reach a deniability status, if you get what I mean. And so it is very strange that in this case, there's no deniability at all. Um, but the books show that, in fact, there was even no need for public negotiations because everything was done and completed. It's all that was necessary was to declare a new constitution and things should be normal. Mm -hmm. Well, there are lots of ethical problems around that. But this is one of the points I want to make, that those negotiations before the negotiations actually meant that, oh, you see, we are going to secure our interests now. And they made sure that that happened. Lots of meetings in the brand test, whatever, all this is mentioned. Now, after securing that, I don't think capital uh, has the virtue of trusting someone else. So what they decided was, you also make laws which will make it possible for us to take as much money out of the country as we would like. Even more, you must make it legally possible to decide that we now transfer our monies from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange to the London or the New York Stock Exchange. You see, again, Rachel is thinking that just in case there is a reversal of this, then our unjustly acquired privileges and wealth should be safe. So concessions we made, this thing is happening. And of course, uh, uh, Patrick Bond has a very interesting text on that called Global Apartheid, which shows exactly how this flight of capital was managed, how it was allowed to go. And so in a way, we live in a South Africa that is rather poor, but still, the people who took and continue to take out the money are still here until the worst comes. Uh, many people from, uh, from outside would think that uh, Nelson Mandela conducted the transition uh, in order to avoid a civil war. And so it was a very pragmatic type of approach uh, to see that probably the struggle is not ended, but that's the best that we can get at this point in time. What I want to say is that there is a sense, in your view, of betrayal. A betrayal of uh, a, an aspiration of liberation of people, and we even talk of uh, limping, limping, uh, yes. limping sovereignty and limited sovereignty, so to say, precisely because the land was not recognized as part of the restoration of the equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But then your argument runs also in some difficulties because you say, well, the indigenous people of this country, but who are they? After all, the Bantu were invaders, the Khoisan were, the, were not the original people in these regions. Uh, should they be the holders of the land or the Bantu people? Who are the, in the, who are the Africans? We'll come to that. But, you know, who are the holders of the titles? Yeah, you see, that's why I, I started by saying that there are problems with South African historiography. Mm -hmm. Okay, I meant exactly that. Now that you make it concrete, let me explain a little bit. Mm -hmm. South African historiography, which is exclusive, like the fact that we are excluded from the Constitution. We are excluded from having a voice in the history which claims that 
We just come from the north. We came almost at the same time, you know, and so we have no title to this. And the, the only people who have the title are the Khoi and the Sun peoples. And we, we massacred them and so on. Well, because it is history with a very precarious slaying to objectivity, I just want to point at few aspects which show that this objectivity borders on the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we can all migrate from the north? And why is it that you are completely silent about the fact that only the Khoi and the Sun people can grow like grass from the soil of South Africa. And not the whole South Africa, mind you, but just from part of South Africa, the Khoi and the Sun people grew like grass, like natural vegetation. The rest of us must come from somewhere. They don't have to come from anywhere else. That is objectivity in historiography. In my visits to South Africa, I see really this kind of low intensity civil war. Uh, and I tell you two, two stories because I think it's important for us to say uh, these small things. One thing was that I was, in, uh, I was going with uh, my friend uh, and a colleague, uh, Chapman Ligosi, we were going from Port Elizabeth to Rhodes, to Gramstown. Mm -hmm. And we could see these huge tracts of land for, for gaming, for safaris and so on. And then I was talking with people that are in struggles, people of the uh, United People, uh, uh, Unemployment People uh, uh, Movement, people that are struggling uh, to get dignity because in these townships we have more than 50% of unemployment. Mm -hmm. People have no land for nothing. So for me, uh, this, you know, after 20 years after the, 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 the apartheid, and one would expect uh, that at least some transformation on this shortage of land on these places and all those huge tracts of land that one would think, you know, even not taking the, your maximalist uh, uh, argument, that is to say, land back to the conquered people, right? Um, even if we wouldn't, wouldn't take that extreme, you know, an, a, a, an agrarian reform strong enough that would really restore to all the peasants' land and to people in urban cities uh, a adequate land for them to till, build their houses, have their gardens, have their agriculture. Why is this not possible? Why is that um, the Constitution allows for this injustice? What, what do you think of that? I, I, I think that uh, there are several layers again to this. Um, <clears throat> We spoke earlier about a lack of education. It's too general. Uh, you see, Professor, um, the transition to constitutional supremacy was not accidental at all. One of the Constitution's provisions is that you may not alienate or expropriate uh, the property of another person. So the vast tracts of land that you have seen are really so-called private property of A, B, C, and D. And if you want to make a law to expropriate them, that law must face the test of the Constitution. Is it going to be expropriation with and without or without a, a compensation? Is it expropriation based on uh, compelling state interest, if I may use one legal expression here? So you see, the constitutional court, the constitution will have to decide that. Not you as the legislator, not you as the representative of the people who are suffering. You, you do not have the power to make law in substance which may not be challenged in the courts. It will and can be challenged. So the leadership, if it really knows, then it must address. If it doesn't address the problem, then its claim to knowledge is, to put it very mildly, questionable. 
And therefore, it calls into question also the ethics of the leadership. Now, when we go to Nkrumah, to whom you referred, and I'm glad you noted that I'm aware he had many political mistakes, like any other politician. Mm -hmm. But you see, uh, Nkrumah was steadfast on principle. Um, he, for example, was promised uh, so-called foreign aid from the United States. And then he published the book, Neo-Colonialism. Yes. And of course, the foreign aid was withdrawn the next morning. But he didn't say, oh, I, I retract everything I have written so that you can give the foreign aid back. Because the truth that he stated there is truth that is related to justice that is required. Mm -hmm. And we know that his death was not accidental. So, I mean, especially his removal from office was not accidental. And this is why I'm saying, when you have a leadership that is actually amenable to the interest of big capital, to democracy in our day. Democracy is gone, let's not pretend otherwise. It is gone. It may just come as a kind of ceremonial Muppet show every five or four years, but it is gone. Democracy is, as you rightly pointed out, the issue now. Now, when this thing happens, when we are going to have a situation in which you must choose as a leader, knowingly, you know that if I make an option to march along with the Democrats, I'm actually saying I am killing everybody softly. You as a person have to ask yourself the question, is this killing justified? Even before the people make their own judgment, mm -hmm. you have to ask yourself, especially because of your knowledge and understanding of things, mm -hmm. am I entering into this and is this killing justified? I, I agree with you. I, I always admired, uh, you know, that book by Nkrumah was a very important book and is still very important. Still very mind. important. But we are at a different time and sometimes your argument may lead us to very surprising conclusions. Mm -hmm. One would think uh, from your reading and from your text that Mugabe is one of those leaders like Nkrumah, which is, who is not compromising on mm -hmm. principle mm -hmm. and is restoring the land uh, to the owners. Mm -hmm. As you know, here in South Africa and in many parts of uh, Africa or uh, in the world, many people say, well, South Africa, let it be as it is because uh, they are scared that something like South, uh, Zimbabwe would occur here mm -hmm. in South Africa. Uh, besides, uh, Mugabe is not a model in the sense uh, democratic, internal democratic. I think that if we take the, your two distinctions, which uh, I think is a very productive distinction, democratization processes and decolonization processes, one would think that Mugabe fares better in the decolonization process than probably in the democratic process. I don't know. It's just, okay. it's just an hypothesis. Yeah. But the situation in Zimbabwe is not a situation that you'd like to see here or not. I'm glad you raised that question. Let me just in brackets say that you know, even if uh, we may not talk decolonization in the strict sense in the case I want to refer to now, you may recall that after the uh, fall of the Tsar in Russia, mm -hmm. um, uh, France demanded that the new regime should pay the foreign debt right. that the, 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 the Tsar owed. And of course, the new regime has told them, if you can find the Tsar, Please get the money from me. <laughs> and over the years, France is trying still. Do you remember the debt? And the Russians always tell them, find the Tsar, and they, the Tsar will pay. Now, that, I think, should tell us something, just something, about being uh, able to stand your ground, one point. When we go to Mugabe, 
I'm glad you say you went to Rhodes. <laughs> of course, the name itself of that university is in one of the men who's supposed to have established <laughs> Rhodesia. Now, Rhodes is a name, but a name that represented capital then, that still represents capital now. Mm -hmm. The capital that controls in Zimbabwe has got different names, but it is the same capital that controls here. Mugabe is like many other leaders, many other human beings, and many other politicians. He also has mistakes, many, many mistakes, political mistakes, just like Nkrumah had, just like Nyerere had. I just want to mention in parentheses that it is interesting that these three leaders are, have been or are Catholics. Just in parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that later exactly, on. We'll exactly. come to that. <laughs> right. So you see, and then with all these mistakes that Mugabe has, which I really censure myself, I incidentally lived and taught in Zimbabwe for four years. So some of these things I noticed, I heard about, I was able to say, this is not right, what Mugabe is doing. So I'm not saying that Mugabe is doing everything right. But what surprised me last year was the fear that you are expressing. Last year we had a World Congress of Philosophy in Greece. And this argument that you raised came up. And there was almost conclusion, and the session was about to end. And the people were quite happy to say, yes, indeed, uh, what happens in Zimbabwe should not be allowed to happen anywhere in Africa and even South Africa. So I raised my hands. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I see that the session is about to close, but this conclusion is seriously contestable. Well, please. Tell me, because as far as I can see, Mugabe is fighting Rhodesian economy in Zimbabwe in order to establish a Zimbabwean economy. From that point of view, it is difficult to say that Mugabe is actually destroying a Zimbabwean economy because an economy of Zimbabwe does not exist. It is in the making. It will exist after he has overcome the Rhodesian, the enduring Rhodesian economy, which he is fighting now. Mm -hmm. If you doubt this, just do tell me of any single African country which at independence also at the same time obtained economic independence. If you can point at one country like that, then for sure Mugabe is doing wrong. If you can't, Mugabe is in principle and in terms of history correct to struggle against the persisting economy of Rhodesia, which is killing the Zimbabweans, and he wants to establish a Zimbabwean economy. Of course, he will not be left alone, just like Nyerere was not left alone to pursue Ujama, mm -hmm. because the consequences of a successful Ujama mm -hmm. would be unpalatable to, to, to capitalism. So when we look at it that way, I can say that there, there is no substance in saying Mugabe is, defend, is destroying the economy of Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. because that one is yet to be born. So how can he destroy what does not exist? Mm -hmm. I don't think so.